happen, right? That's right. Uh, now we have uh, Nick Allen, who's going to talk through Helix 2.0. Uh, it's been a fairly recent update to some of the Helix practices. Uh, he's going to run you through all the modern tooling and the processes. Uh, this will be quite a good, quite interesting for all of us. So Nick, I think we'll uh, hand over to you. I'll make you a presenter. Cool. Thank you. Just trying to fix my uh, webcam brightness. There you go. We see a notepad plus plus. Okay, wrong one. We got all of your secrets. Screenshot. <laughs> Where's the thing? To uh, under the sharing tab, there's a big play button, and under that, there's a little drop down for screen. Ah, yeah, there we go. All right, now see a Windows desktop. Cool. Perfect. There you go. All over to you, man. All right. Thanks, guys. So hi, guys. Um, welcome to Helix 2.0 Modern Tooling and Processes. Um, as Cameras has already mentioned, my name's Nick Allen, and uh, thank you for joining me on this first global and virtual Cycle User Group conference. Um, very brief introduction before I get started. Um, so I'm a Cycle practice lead or Cycle architect based in the UK. Um, I actually delivered my first Cycle project way back now in 2007. Uh, it was actually Cycle 5 free at the time. And I'm a current um, 2020 MVP. I've had the opportunity to work on quite a lot of Cycle projects also in, in Canada and the US during my stay in Toronto. And I'm looking forward to presenting today. So I hope you guys enjoy it. So Helix patterns and principles have kind of been around for a while now, but recently, uh, so November 2019, version 2.0 of the Helix documentation was published on GitHub. And as Helix has evolved, I think the community, the community has really responded as well in terms of best practices for Helix patterns, approaches to tooling, and Helix-specific DevOps solutions. A lot of Helix surveys that I see at various conferences kind of paint the same picture, which is the majority of Cycle developers are now working on Helix solutions, which got me thinking about the ideal developer experience to get up and running quickly, feel enabled by Helix and not inhibited by some of the things that come with Helix, um, feel enabled by the process of module management, and then also protected by some automated quality checks as well. Um, so I drew a bunch of inspiration from the community. Uh, and I'll include as many references as I can uh, during this talk. But before I get into any specifics, I want to start at the beginning. So this journey was in part inspired by a recent large project uh, where my role was cycle lead and also technical governance. So this particular project used a central governance and sort of squad model. And the central team were responsible for direction, leadership, and overall quality control. And our squads or teams were fully autonomous, self-sufficient teams responsible for planning, development, uh, and QA of their own features, and also free to manage their environments and CI CD pipelines as they saw fit, and for, in terms of how, you know, where they are, where their comfort levels are, in terms of their DevOps stack. But we also had a centrally managed integrated environment that from a DevOps perspective, kind of aligned closely to the client stack, which eased kind of delivery into the client's hiring environments and also represented sort of the merged efforts of all of our squads. Ultimately though, we were a single team working on a single solution with an overall outcome. So right uh, as I want to go involved in the project, there were some decisions to make about um, how to make delivery efficient in terms of division of tasks and team collaboration. And generally speaking, we can kind of describe any software development project as being understood as A, a number of components under change, and B, a number of features that the business desires to implement or adapt. And there's a couple of ways we can approach this. So horizontal development aligns teams to system components, and this tends to happen naturally, uh, just due to the nature of tech stacks and also resource skills 
So you don't necessarily have full stack developers in every in every team. Uh, you get kind of specializations across a kind of a component level. But delivery by component isn't in and of itself necessarily valuable to the business, and it can encourage partially developed features. And it can also be difficult to end-to-end -end test, again, from a business value perspective. Alternatively, we can look at vertical development. So instead of aligning to system components, we align around business features, and our work is bound by this idea of business value. So interestingly, this draws some parallels with the reuse release equivalency principle of package cohesion, it's a bit of a mouthful, which a lot of the thinking around Helix module boundaries gets its inspiration from. And to quote the 2.0 documentation, a module should serve a single business audience, which if you think about it, is kind of at odds with the notion of a module being sort of bound to something like atomic designs, or in other words, like an accordion or something by itself, doesn't really deliver business value in most cases or, or solve a business problem. Uh, because of the nature of vertical work, it does mean that your features can be more complex due to the full stack nature of them, but it does encourage delivery of business value and less waste and also less technical debt. That being said, vertical, de vertical development doesn't come without challenges. I've al already mentioned the full stack nature of organizing around features. But we also observe that something interesting happens as you get closer toward the end of the project. Teams begin to converge on each other and the need for common tooling and practices increases. In some cases, we also found that resources needed to collaborate across squads. Um, for example, a back-end developer in squad A now has a dependency on the work of a front-end developer in squad B, and we're not, we don't have that clean kind of vertical separation of business features that we had at the beginning. So the particular project I'm describing actually wasn't a Helix solution, but it did spike my interest in terms of how would that have worked if it was, especially considering vertical feature-driven development, the need for common tools and practices. But I think you can see quite easily how Helix can help with this type of situation, given the common notion of boundaries around business value and improving the maintainability of the solution and allowing developers to move across features or modules due to a sort of consistent overall architecture. Um, but as Helix has been around for a while now, and, and every now and again, you, you do hear some of the, I'll use the term criticisms of Helix, um, but you hear some common themes. So Helix actually slows me down. Adding new projects to a solution is, is laborious and error prone. My solution takes too long to open. My solution takes too long to build. Um, all my CI CD pipelines are now more complicated than I want them to be. Which raised the question, can some of these uh, complaints be mitigated through tooling and process refinement? And what can modern tooling and the Sitecore community contributions do to help with some of these scenarios? I'm going to pause just for a second. So the main focus of this talk is not around best practices for module design or things like the merits of logical versus physical boundaries or even module design smells. Um, these are all excellent topics um, and there are some excellent resources out there. I absolutely recommend the official Helix documentation and they actually reference some additional um, assets uh, by Martin Davies specifically who does has done a great job on, on Helix smells um, and also some of the content that Alan Coates has put out there on, on dependencies between modules and, and how to handle some of that. So I'm not necessarily touching on best practices from a module design perspective but for the rest of the talk I'll be looking at getting hands-on with some of the tools and processes that try to address some of the challenges and try and demonstrate what the developer experience could look like. But before I go straight to a, into a, a demo, let's set the scene a little bit more. I think a good test of tooling and processes is how easy it is for a new developer on the project to get up and running. So today's demo will be from that point of view, uh, a new developer joining a squad, on a project that's getting up and running for the first time. So the only prerequisites that we've asked our developers to take care of on their local machines is ensuring that they have Visual Studio 2017 Plus, SQL Server, 
be an instance of Sitecore 9.3, XP0, and Node.js. Now, of course, there are a lot of ways to install a clean instance of Sitecore 9.3. There's a lot of work happening now around containers, the Sitecore installation framework. We can write custom uh, SIF scripts. But today, we're going to assume that our developers use the Sitecore install assistant, which is essentially a, a GUI that uh, installs prerequisites on your machine and executes SIF scripts under the hood. Uh, so in this scenario, we actually, with a Assuming it's a, a new installation of Windows 10 Pro, um, we don't even have to enable IIS as a feature, install the Sitecore installation framework, or even Solar. The install assistant is going to take care of all of that for us. All we need to do is install SQL Server 2070. Now, of course, this is only relevant to a developer setup. That's kind of the focus for today. The install assistant is also available for Sitecore 9.2. Just bear in mind with the 9.2 version, you do also need to install Solar first. Uh, it won't do that for you. Um, but, uh, but Jeremy Davies has written some excellent SIF uh, extensions that allow you to do that very easily uh, with a little bit of configuration and a tiny bit of PowerShell. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to switch over to uh, my demo. And you guys should be able to see a Windows desktop. So this is a completely clean machine. There's, there's nothing on it at all other than those prerequisites that I, that I just explained. So the first thing we're going to do is check out our source code. So let's go ahead and open Visual Studio. Let's clone our repository. And I'll drop it in a folder that I've already got prepared. So this shouldn't take very long. There's hardly anything in this solution at the moment. Again, this is a first time setup, so I'm getting a couple notifications here. That's fine, that's expected. And now we've got our basic solution structure. So I'm sure we'll all be familiar with the concept of layers, feature foundation projects. Um, and in this particular solution, we've got a couple of additional folders uh, for instance, build, and TDS. I'm going to come back to those later in the demo. So I've been given the task of creating a feature module for the main navigation. So again, this is not necessarily a recommendation for module design, but I will just be demonstrating a specific scenario. So first of all, I'm going to create a branch for this feature. We have a specific naming convention we're using here. Okay, cool. Hey, so the Nick, first thing, uh, you... can you zoom into the code when you, uh, whenever you show some code, people have asked just to zoom in a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that. So typically, the first thing you're going to do when you create a new module is go through the process of setting up your um, projects, your first kind of main project for your module. Um, now, again, that's that kind of hand manual laborial. Kind of laborious process I mentioned before. But instead of doing that, I'm going to use Yeoman. I'm sure many of you have probably heard of Yeoman before, um, but it's essentially uh, a, uh, a generator ecosystem. So a generator is basically a plugin that can be run with the Yo command to scaffold complete projects or useful parts, also known as sub generators. So let's get started by opening a developer console. And since I've already got my solution, I'm not going to be running a full generator. I'm just going to be using a sub generator. So after the yo command, I've got the name of my generator. There are a bunch of generators already published out to NPM. Um, and I'll, I'll call out a few that have definitely helped me kind of on, on my journey of building out a custom generator. So we've got um, generators by Anastasia Flynn, uh, the guys at Pentio and the guys at EPAM, excellent examples. And those are out there on GitHub. Uh, I don't really have scope within this talk to go into the kind of details of how to write Yeoman generators, but there's a lot of excellent documentation out there. 
and open source projects, as I've already mentioned. Um, but we're using a custom generator here. So the first thing I have is the name of my generator. The colon add indicates that I'm using a sub-generator and the specific sub-generator I'm using is to add a module to my solution. And I've provided an argument, which is the module name of main navigation. So let's go ahead and run that. So the first thing it's asking me is to confirm back that I'm, am I sure this is the module name that I wanna use? I might have had to introduce a typo or something like that, but I'm good with that. I'm gonna use an organization prefix for my module names. Uh, this is a feature in this instance, and we're using .NET 472. So you can completely customize the prompting phase of a generator, which is this is called in Yeoman sense. Okay, so that's all done. So let's go ahead and our solution is detected with change, so let's reload. So there we go. I have my main module project fully scaffolded out for me with some default folders and some default files in there. So that was nice and easy. The generator that I've kind of come up with just adds the bare bones of the module and kind of expects you to opt in to all of the additional projects that you might need. And this is to avoid unnecessary project bloat in the solution or expecting you to kind of remove all the unnecessary projects that you don't want. But today I've going to decide that I also want some serialization uh, with this module and I want some unit tests. So I'm going to invoke a separate sub-generator. In this case, I'm going to use TDS as an example for serialization. And I'm going to pass in my module name again as an argument. So for TDS, it's asking me which version of TDS we're using. I'm just going to use the latest version. Again, confirming the target module, which layer it sits in and which database do I want to manage? In this case, the master. Now I have run this generator on this machine before. So Yeoman also has a concept of a, a local store or a cache if you like, which is really handy because it means I don't have to re-enter um, information over and over again if it's gonna be the same for, across sub-generators. So in this case, it already, I've, it already picked up the fact that I've already entered my host name previously and it knows the, the path to my local website. So TDS kind of needs that to know how to communicate with Sitecore. So that's all done. I'm also gonna run that again, but this time I want another project for my core items. And before I go back to Visual Studio, we may as well add our unit test project. So I'm gonna add tests to my feature as well. Okay. So let's go and reload and see what we've got. Okay, awesome. So I've got everything scaffolded out. I haven't had to look at the file system once. I can just run my generator and I'm confident that I'm using the same folder structures and conventions that everybody else who's working on this project is going to be using as well. Um, so I'm gonna, at this point, just build the solution and just check everything's good. and our build has failed, so let's figure out why. So I'm being told that I need to configure a publish URL. Um, so what is this publish URL? At this point, I'll introduce the Helix Publishing Pipeline. The Helix Publishing Pipeline is an open source project created by Richard uh, Zaloy. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. HPP allows Helix solutions to be published as a single unit with content from modules like views and config patches being automatically included. It also contains optimizations and guidance around local development deployments. This is how HPP describes itself on its homepage. And it's HPP telling us that we need to tell it where we want to publish our modules to. This is configured in a central project called uh, my instance project. And this will act as a web route from a publishing perspective. But since this is not a module in and of itself, i.e. It doesn't, doesn't deliver any business value, um, I don't wanna deploy it with my modules. So it's better to keep this separate, I, I think, uh, away from our layer folders. HPP can also discover the modules to include in the publishing operation using patterns, which are defined in directory.build.props. And I'll make this a little bit bigger. Hopefully that's okay, if not, let me know. Directory.build.props 
directory.build.build.props is a way to add a new property to every project in one step by defining it in a single file. So if you're not using this in your projects, it's definitely something I'd recommend doing a little research into. It can make your life much easier. HPP is also built using standard MS Build conventions, so no need to add additional tools to your stack if you want to avoid things like Gulp and Cake, or if you've, if you've looked at those tools. Um, I'm not necessarily saying those things in, in and of themselves are bad things to use, but if you're looking for an alternative that it doesn't introduce those new tools, then like I say, HPP is just built on base on standard MS Build conventions. So I'm going to go ahead and add this publish URL since I'm missing it. And I'm going to add that to my local publish profile. So that's uh, one thing you do need to do actually after modifying this is, is reopen your solution. So let's go ahead and do that. So now my publish should be working. and that has now run successfully. So the publish URL I provided is actually an empty folder on my, on my disk. So I wanted to kind of show what HPP actually packages and publishes. So if we take a look here, we can see that we've got our bin folder, which just contains our module DLLs. Um, it's excluded things like test projects, of course, um, and we don't have any of the site core assemblies in here. So HPP does an awesome job of allowing you to download the Sitecore assembly lists from dev.sitecore.net. So they're published with every version of Sitecore. Uh, I think, I believe it's a CSV format, I'm pretty sure. Um, and HPP will read that and make sure that none of those DLLs that come with Sitecore um, are included in your packaging process. So obviously that greatly reduces your um, the size of your packages. Uh, you can re-include them if you want to. Um, so there are kind of options to configure it to allow certain files to be included in the package. So it's really flexible. You'll also notice that the root of this directory contains a file called uh, web.helix.config. With, e with HPP, each module can own its own web.config transformations. Uh, so you basically store a web.helix.config file on the root of every module, add your transformations there, and then HPP does the job of combining all of those into a single transform file. So that single transform file can be used by your build server to apply all of your necessary transforms to the stock Sitecore web config in one go. Again, it's a really useful tool. And for local development purposes, you can also target a specific web.config on your local disk. So if you want to modify the web.config in your local website, you can do that as well. So let's go back to our solution. I'm going to take a closer look at my main module project, and I'm going to open the project file. So normally we have to unload the project, edit the CS project file, but in this case, we can just double click on it and get the project file straight away. And obviously, if you're used to the traditional CS project format, um, there's a lot less information we're seeing here. So this is the uh, relatively new um, uh, SDK project format introduced by Microsoft. It was introduced primarily for .NET Core projects to migrate away from package.json because there was issues with package.json kind of mapping onto CS proj um, settings or the CS proj format, sorry. And it was introduced in MS Build 15. So not super new, but relatively new. Um, the way, obviously one of the things that's missing here is any kind of notion of which files to include in our projects. And that's because the, prod, the SDK format actually uses file globbing to include uh, file uh, or include files in, in your project for compilation purposes um, by uh, convention. Uh, as, as I've already mentioned, the traditional CS prod files very verbose, it can also be difficult to edit. And one of the key things, it, it kind of hides the intent away for, in terms of your customizations. So it's hard to separate the things that you've customized from the things that were there um, by default. So the SDK project format allows us to just override the pieces that we need to. And I think that makes uh, the developer experience much easier, a lot cleaner, and we can clearly see what we're changing and why. Uh, there are ways to see the expanded CS proj file. Um, so you can see the full thing. Um, and I'll show that a little bit later. 
if I look at my dependencies, I'm also referencing uh, the Cycle Kernel and Cycle MVC uh, NuGet packages. Uh, and actually, one of the pieces you didn't see as part of that uh, Yeoman scaffolding process is it's able to know exactly which version of Sitecore uh, we're using, so it doesn't need to prompt us to ask us any of those types of questions and which versions of NuGet packages to add. It's all taken care of behind the scenes. You'll also note that there is no packages.config uh, inside of this project. Um, if we look at the, uh, the build folder that I mentioned earlier, we also have a directory.build.props there. So again, uh, this imports a file called instance.packageReferences. And because this directory.build.props is at the root of my solution, uh, these um, project settings will be applied to all of the projects in my layer folders automatically. So no need to keep going into each individual project and set up some of our, our base settings. If I look at package references, we're including cycle kernel, cycle MPC, plus some other things. Um, so usual NuGet rules apply here. So there's nothing weird going on from a NuGet perspective. Everything you know about NuGet is all the same. The difference here is that we can manage our NuGet packages directly within our CS proj files and use things like the directory.build.probs to propagate that out to all of our projects. Um, package references also store uh, your NuGet packages in a global folder on your machine. So if you're working across projects that all reference the same uh, packages, then there's a performance benefit to doing that. We're not downloading the same NuGet packages over and over again for different solutions. And the other benefit here to package references is they use uh, transitive dependencies. So a transitive dependency, transitive dependency is an indirect dependency. So you depend on something which itself has another dependency that you don't depend on. In newer versions of, of Sitecore, um, in the Sitecore feeds, we no longer get the no references packages which means if I reference cycle kernel, for example, I'm gonna get all of the uh, packages that depend on that showing up in my references list. So again, I'm seeing a bunch of stuff that's kind of cluttering up my workspace. And it's kind of hiding, again, that keyword, the intent of the developer who added that package. Um, so we're only seeing the top level packages with package references and the dependencies are kind of managed behind the scenes. Coming back to our TDS projects, uh, we do use a TDS global config. So if you are using TDS and you're not using a global config, this is something I'd recommend looking at. It essentially allows us to um, manage common settings for our TDS projects in one place and have that apply to all of the TDS projects in our solution. So again, no need to keep setting things like um, the, the web service or the connector GUI in every single project. Uh, also, along with this, uh, we actually, before I move on, let's just take a look at that on our master TDS project. So as you can see, our, our key kind of tab from a development perspective, our build tab is kind of already pre-populated with a combination of things that came from the Omen scaffolding process, such as the web UI local web URL and local folder, and things that have come from the TDS global configuration. So there's really nothing for me to do here other than just test that my project can communicate with Sitecore, and it does. So all I've had to do is scaffold that out from Yeoman with one line and a few um, options to pick, and the rest is already taken care of. As well as our instance project that controls the, the packaging of our code, we've also got an instance project that controls the packaging of all of our uh, module items, so it can be deployed in one go. And if I have a look at the properties of this, in the bundling section, our scaffolding process was also able to modify our instance projects to ensure that our new TDS projects are included in the package bundling process. That's a very easy thing to forget, right? So if you add a new TDS project to the, uh, to the solution and forgetting to add that to the bundles in, in the main instance um, project. So that's all taken care of by the scaffolding process. Another thing as a developer that we don't have to worry about. So I'm pretty happy with how things have gone so far. I'm just gonna go ahead and push some of these changes to my remotes. And I'll just call that an initial commit. 
I'm trying to stay inside Visual Studio as much as possible here, just to kind of show that you know how much you can do just within one tool. Okay, so I just had a look. I've got everything structured out. I've got all the projects I need um, for my for my new feature, and I've just taken a look at the designs, and I've noticed that it's also got a mega menu component. So I'm deciding. I'm going, I'm going to decide to add another. Uh, feature module to the solution and you may be detecting a helix smell here and I'm going to call it mega menu I'll just add that project for now that's fine so now let's do something very strange I'm going to go to my main navigation projects. Add a class called uh, main navigation service. I'll just copy paste some code here. And then let's go a lot across to my uh, mega menu module and add a mega menu service. Interest of time, let's copy some code, paste some code. And I've got a dependency on an object here that um, I'm going to need to have to add a reference to my main navigation feature module. So I'm not worried about that. Let's do that. Fine. It's the worst that could happen. In any case, I'm feeling happy about this as well, so I'm going to go ahead and push that. Let's call this navigation services. Okay, cool. So what I'm trying to demonstrate here is I've got some protection against these kind of mistakes uh, on my build server. So I'm using Azure DevOps that's running in the background and that has a canary build, which is configured to continuously build any branches that start with the feature prefix and also um, our master branch as well. So if I actually look at the builds menu in here, I can see that 10 seconds ago, we had a successfully completed build. Um, and that was my initial commit where I just structured out my projects and hadn't really started writing any code. So that build was fine. There was no issues with that. So let's actually go to the build server itself and see what's going on. Okay, so there's our first build that was published successfully. And if I look at the, the artifacts from that build, from that Canary build, here's our web deploy package that has been generated by our instance project. So that's going to contain a, a single package with all of the code from all of our modules that we can deploy all in one go. One thing I didn't mention about the um, Helix publishing pipeline is it also allows us to define a parameters.xml file in the root of each project. And that allows us to parameterize our web deploy packages at a module level as well. And that all gets combined again into a, a single um, parameters file. So super handy um, for deploying your packages as, as part of a release pipeline and configuring, thing, configuring things differently for different environments. If I go back to my pipelines, uh, this one's still running. Let's see how it's getting on. Okay, that's still building, so that's fine. But interestingly, what's coming next, if we've got some FX cop code analysis here. So the folks uh, uh, over at Hedgehog, when they built out TDS, also built a set of FX cop custom rules that will analyze um, projects and uh, flag issues around violations of Helix principles. Um, so this is super useful. Uh, this is something you can, of course, run on your local machine, but if you know, if you're a developer, you're not really paying attention to that. 
we've still got we've still got protection on our build server um, to give us some really fast early feedback if we're doing anything that kind of goes against those Helix principles. So this build has failed on our FX code analysis, which we kind of expected it to do based on the code that I, I added there. This time, if we look at the artifacts published by the build, uh, we've got an FX cop report this time. So let's have a look at that. I think our issue, uh, let me make that a bit bigger. I think our issue is gonna be in the mega menu because of course we're doing feature to feature dependencies. And let's have a look at the messages that we got here. So it's got some issues with some of the other things that I put in there and that's all fine. But the one we're interested in here is the property main navigation service in namespace think fresh feature mega menu may not reference the namespace think fresh dot feature dot main navigation and that's our custom fx cop rules detecting helix violations so that kind of rounds out the scenarios that i kind of wanted to walk through from a demo perspective so hopefully you can see there that when you start to put all the pieces together um, either from some of the, the newer things that Microsoft's doing, some of the community contributions around uh, Yeoman generators and custom FX cop rules, and you put all those pieces together, you can build out a, a developer experience that, that's, that's quite nice to work with. And of course, you know, this is just kind of my idea of what I would like to see from a developer experience, and you can customize this uh, however you see fit. So I'm just going to switch back to slides for a moment here and just kind of recap what we've done there. Okay, so we can see that our developer was able to get up running quickly and contributing to the project immediately using Helix architecture and with the protection of local validation and early warnings from the Canary builds. We also used, as I mentioned before, scaffolding, some of the newer project formats, package references, the Helix Publishing Pipeline, um, some validation from FXCOP, and uh, some modifications to our CI CD pipelines. So, Yeoman, just to summarize, uh, it's installed using NPM. Uh, it's a very simple installation process. Uh, we have generators, sub generators, a prompting system, a writing system, uh, and those stored configs for remembering some of the things that we've provided to our prompt uh, prompts earlier on. Um, I think Yeoman's awesome and it's highly extensible, but I also understand that using technology such as NPM and depending on JavaScript to write your scaffolding system isn't going to be everyone to everyone's liking. So if you are looking for a similar scaffolding solution that doesn't introduce these tool sets, then I would recommend looking at the Cycle Helix Visual Studio templates, which is a Visual Studio extension by Anders Laub. It's it's all you know very similar concepts to what I demonstrated from Yeoman and, and you can customize the templates that you use and it, it works very well so I've, I've, I've had a look at that and there's some excellent um, documentation and videos on that as well um, so that's definitely one to look at if you're not so um, if you, you don't kind of really like the, the whole Yeoman system um, the reason I kind of prefer Yeoman and it's not trying to compare these two tools at all but um, obviously, because with Yeoman, you're writing everything pretty much tailored to you exactly. You've got a lot of flexibility there. But both tools are, are worth looking at. The SDK project format. So again, introduced in MS Build 15 um, for .NET Core migration away from package.json. One of those key things is the inclusion of those files by default or file globbing and a massively simplified project file. So I mentioned being able to see the fully expanded project. So you can run .NET just from a command line at the root of your solution, uh, root of your project, sorry, uh, .NET MS build dash PP colon full project XML, and that will write an XML file to disk. Uh, you can open that up and see the fully expanded um, project. You can include, also include uh, NuGet metadata properties right in your project file. Um, so that will be picked up by .NET pack. Uh, if you do have a new spec file though, that will supersede this. So all of the, those metadata properties will be ignored by if you've got a new spec file. Um, but if you do want to kind of move away from new spec and store all of those uh, packaging metadata properties inside your project file, you can do that. And there's also at the moment currently support for class libraries and console apps. So you may be thinking, what about our kind of MVC projects? Uh, I have tried the SDK project format with 
uh, .NET MVC projects and it builds absolutely fine. Uh, where you might run into some issues with that uh, is around tooling. So things like IntelliSense inside Razor Views, that type of thing don't work very well uh, or don't work at all in some sense, uh, in some cases with the SDK project format. But if you're not using Razor Views for your front end code, then that's not necessarily a problem. But one to think about. Um, some people have mentioned that they've run into issues with solutions that contain mixed project formats. So having some SDK projects, some regular um, ASP.NET web application and regular traditional CS proj files. I haven't found that problem. Um, I don't think that that's not been an issue for me uh, at all. So I think it's certainly uh, one that's worth the transition um, for what it brings. Uh, just be aware of some of the limitations and plan for that. And the package references. Uh, so again, no packages.config and all other aspects of NuGet still apply. So some of the things I didn't touch on, so you can use MS build conditions to choose package references per target framework. So that's kind of cool if you're building a, say like a foundation module that you want to support across multiple versions of Sitecore, you can use uh, MS build conditions uh, in, in that to help with that. Um, and there is support for floating versions. So uh, NuGet will resolve the highest version of a package that matches the version pattern. So that not necessarily thinking you do that with a Sitecore library, we tend to lock into a specific version of Sitecore, but think about your kind of third party libraries that you're also including. Uh, so you may want to kind of keep kind of using the, the, the most up-to-date versions of those, and we can just use floating versions to, to manage that. Uh, I mentioned uh, global packages, global packages folder, which can speed things up for you and the, and the transitive dependencies. Uh, one word of warning. So with the newer versions of Sitecore, we start to see um, uh, NuGet packages for the whole, the entire platform. So you can kind of uh, reference uh, package in that way. So you may be thinking, well, I can do that now because I'll only see the top level package. Well, you can, but those dependencies are still being downloaded in the background. So there's a lot of dependencies if you reference the framework, the, the whole platform. Uh, so you're gonna slow yourself down if you do that. And importantly, package references are under active development. So they are the future. Um, so I think, again, one that's definitely worth looking at. There are some other limitations, um, so be aware of those, but if you can migrate to them, I would certainly recommend it. The Helix Publishing Pipeline, um, auto module discovery, publish on build optionally, uh, the exclusion of Sitecore assemblies, uh, and every module has its own parameters like XML. One thing I'll point out here specifically is there is a Helix-based project out on GitHub, and that's a, an excellent resource to use as an integration reference. So um, HPP is part of that, and that was very useful to me, um, getting HPP integrated into my solution structure. Um, so thanks to Richard for that and all the uh, folks who've contributed to that project. It's, it's pretty awesome. Then we had our FX COT rules to enforce Helix principles by convention. And in my scenario, I've actually got a, an MS build project in the solution that the build server um, effectively runs, which uh, sort of detects every single um, project that you have inside of your solution by convention um, and applies the, the validation to all of your projects in one go. So some of the um, documentation around using the, the Hedgehog FX Cop Helix uh, package kind of refers to having to modify individual project files, but I found it easier just to create an MS build project um, and just have it automatically pick everything up. So I don't need to touch my projects at all. Um, one disclaimer here. So obviously the, the title of this talk is Modern Tooling um, and Processes. Um, this kind of way of doing um, FX COP analysis on compiled DLLs isn't really, is kind of a legacy approach now. So it's been superseded by uh, the .NET compiler platform or Roslyn um, and, and that comes with code analyzers. So what you can do with that is you can actually analyze your C sharp code as you type. Um, so obviously huge benefits to that. Um, I've not had much time to look into that, but it's certainly something I'm interested in. Uh, if there are folks out there who have managed to do that, um, I'd be really interested to hear about that. And then we had some modifications to our CI CD pipeline. Um, not super complex here, just a simple canary build um, for fast feedback that targets master and feature, all feature branches um, using that MS uh, build project that I mentioned. 
and of course uh, team notifications on failure. And then with our two instance projects, we're generating a single package web deploy package, a parameterized web deploy package um, for deployment of our code, and a single item package for deployment of our items. So package once, deploy everywhere. One thing I didn't show actually, which I will just briefly show here, um, is obviously this is working on a solution that has been um, uh, already created for us. But if we are, say, a little bit a step back in the process where we want to create our solution file in the first place, uh, let's just call this uh, ShowCon-B, then What we can do is we can just call yo, and this is our main generator. So I talked about main generators versus sub generators. So just by calling yo, we'll give you a list of all of the generators you have installed on your system. Uh, so it's picked up the fact that I've got this Thinkfresh Helix generator, uh, and this is running the main generator for generating a solution um, in the first place. So if I run that, it's gonna ask me for a project name. Uh, let's go for Shukar 2020 organization name again it's picking up from my previous inputs what kind of which version of cycle do I want to use so right now I only have one option but within your generator you can add additional options of course if your team are working across uh, different projects using different versions of cycle um, and also options around serialization so I show TDS you can also generate um, the assets that you need for unicorn or this might be a project where actually you don't need any item serialization so you might pick none uh, and then based on my previous input, asking more questions, which version of TBS, uh, which versions of the .NET framework, again, that's tied into the version of Sitecore that I selected. So if I picked early versions of Sitecore, I would get a different set of framework options here. And so that's gonna go ahead and run. If I go into here, oh, on file, my bad. I'm going to here and open this solution. then we're right back to where we kind of began at the start with all of those initial files. So just as simple as that, to get a new solution file up and running, push it into source control and have the team start working on that straight away. I'm running out of time here, so... Yeah. We need to wrap uh, up, Nick. Cool, last slide. So just in conclusion, um, I would encourage you to spend time just thinking about your ideal developer experience. Uh, don't assume any boundaries and then kind of work back from there and find the tools and processes that will deliver your ideas. Could be from Microsoft, could be from Sitecore. Obviously, it's going to be things out there in the community, also unrelated tech communities. Um, so just stay tuned to how the frameworks and languages you use are changing and evolving and discover the features that can positively impact your developer experience. And with that, um, obviously, I will... We are in a serious situation now globally, um, so if you do have the time and, and, and the, the means to do so, um, please donate uh, to this worthy cause that we are running as part of Virtual ShukCon. Thanks, Nick. Awesome, thanks, Nick. We do have a, a handful of questions here. Uh, cool. First one, I'm using HPP, but it publishes my instance deal out of the site. How do you exclude it? Yeah, good question. Um, so let's switch back to my uh, first solution. <clears throat> and what we have done here inside of uh, the instance.wpp.targets is add that as a exclude from package files option. So that's that's right there. Awesome. Um, hey, great stuff. A question: Is there a reason why you're not using TDS as your build as your quote build deploy project in uh, the Think Fresh instance? Uh, yeah. So. Um, so obviously you can deploy your local code with TDS um, to your to your local website. Um, what you don't get with that, however, is all the stuff that HPP does. So things like um, the combining of all the web.config transforms, um, the ability to kind of ex 
well, you can do obviously do um, DLL exclusion and inclusion in, in TDS. Um, but I just kind of made the decision to kind of delegate everything to do with publishing of, of code and just give that responsibility to HPP and HPP alone, and then have TDS just worry and care about item serialization and nothing else. Cool. So is there, uh, is there any yeoman scaffolding for JSS projects or Unicorn instead of TDS? Yes, there is. Um, so I mentioned uh, the folks at EPAM, I believe their generator supports uh, JSS. Um, I can't remember exactly how they've organized their generators, whether it's a sub generator or part of the main solution generator, but there's definitely support for that in, in, in the one that EPAM, I think it's called, uh, in fact, I can tell you what it's called. It's called, uh, uh, sitecore-engx-scaffold. So it's on GitHub, you'll find it easily. Uh, do you ever have issues with the solution caching the Visual Studio uh, caching by Visual Studio when you add new projects via Yeoman? Uh, no, that's not one I've run into. Um, that being said, uh, I've done all of this on Visual Studio 2019. Uh, it could be that that's something that's happening in a different version of Visual Studio. Um, Actually, one thing I did notice as well, I think uh, I have seen some of the other generators that have been published sort of ways to um, tell uh, Visual Studio that something's changed and force it to reload everything. So that's probably, they're doing that because of the thing that you're, you're raising there, but, it, but it's not something I've hit. Okay. How are you handling code that is not deployed to the CMCD roles? Are you taking a mono repo approach? Or are you creating separate Visual Studio solutions, separate repos? You know, and stuff. We're talking about X Connect and things like that. Right. Okay. Um, so that's not a scenario I've really got to yet in terms of how to handle that. I think with anything, you know, pure Sitecore, I'm targeting, you know, just Sitecore nine and above with this stuff. So in terms of CMCD, we obviously can control stuff um, using roles. Uh, and there are ways to, and obviously this because this is all built on MS Build conventions there are ways to kind of control what kind of code you include and what code you don't based on the build configuration that you're using. Um, so that's kind of where you get into extension points of HPP. Um, so I imagine it would be super easy to do just, just using standard MS build stuff, um, but it's not it's not something I've, I've, I've looked at specifically. All right. Um, is the Yeoman generator that was used available online? I think you already talked about this, but it will be, but not yet. Um, so as I said, I kind of looked out across all the generators that were already out there and kind of looked at the bits that I wanted to take and, and add the bits, my own bits, and just to kind of put all the pieces together in a way that worked for me and put that into a generator. Um, there's a couple of little roots and bugs that I need to iron out on that first, but once I've done that, then yes, that will be pushed out to, um, I'll push that out to NPM. Awesome. Well, that's all the questions that we've got so far. So, nice cool. job, Nick. Yep, thanks for your presentation, Nick. Thanks, guys. Have a good rest of your day. Actually, you wanna bring up the... Yes, sir. All right, so our next presenters are Andre and Alexi. Marketing automation and Sitecore experience commerce. We've still got a few minutes. Let's do another mm -hmm. little shout out to the... Uh... And how are we doing on the donations? Uh, so right now, let me come back here. We are 2100. Making progress. Awesome. So if you have not already done so, 
um, please donate to the, the COVID-19 Solidarity Fund. Uh, every little bit helps, so don't think your um, amount is any lesser than anyone else. Every little bit helps. And you want to uh, flash up the the Zoom back or the Zoom there you go. break room page too. Uh, we do have uh, for those that are just joining or coming back. This is the URL. We've got a Zoom meeting um, out there. It's just kind of an open open forum, uh, kind of like the the break room or the uh, the time between sessions that we have uh, typically in person at Subcons. Um, but we've got that set up at Zoom, um, and this is the password and the Bitly link. Um, please don't share this password um, on any of the socials because bad things happen. I hear when you do that, so um, we'd rather not that happen here. So anyway, but yeah, that that's an additional um, channel for you to to connect with with uh, some of your psycho friends that you'd normally connect with, you know, in person at SUCCON. So that's out there too. So. How are you guys doing, Andre and Alexi? Hey guys. Hi, actually, everybody. Oh, you guys are in the office? Yes, yes. but we keep the distance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like you guys are the only one there. Uh, in the opposite side of the office. Oh. Jason, you... you've got a really cool background. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've been switching it out. So you can probably make Andre uh, a presenter. Yeah, yes, please. Yeah. Right. And um, just before we get started, if any questions during the session, you don't have to wait till the end of the session to add your questions into the question panel on uh, GoToWebinar. It helps us better prepare to ask questions to the presenters once um, once they're done presenting and doesn't waste time at the end of the presentation when people start adding a bunch of questions. Uh, do whatever you find more convenient. 